On the morning of February 22nd, 537, shortly after dawn, Belisarius exited Rome through the Salarian Gate with some of his cavalry and his personal guards. He was headed north to the Salarian Bridge to check in with the men he had stationed in the bridge's protective towers. He did not know that he was walking into a fight that would very nearly cost him his life. Earlier that month, Bidiges had begun his march south from Ravenna with an army of 150,000 men. That number comes from Procopius and is probably exaggerated at least somewhat, but the Ostrogothic army was definitely much, much larger than the 5,000-man army that Belisarius had in Rome. When Belisarius heard of the size of the approaching army, he knew that he needed all the help that he could get. He ordered Constantinus and Bessus to leave small garrisons in Perugia and Narni and fall back to Rome to help with the city's defenses. Vitiges smartly bypassed these cities and moved as quickly as he could towards his main target. He approached Rome on February 21st and made a camp a few miles north of the city. That night, the Eastern Roman guards at the Salarian Bridge could see the Ostrogothic campfires just across the Anine River. They knew that they were up against a gigantic force. 22 of these guards were Gothic by birth and decided to desert their posts and join their countrymen. This opened the floodgates, and the rest of the Roman guards soon deserted out of fear, fleeing south to Campania and not daring to face their comrades still in Rome. The next morning, with the bridge now undefended, the Ostrogoths began preparing to cross the Anin and move on the Eternal City. Belisarius did not know that the bridge was unguarded when he approached on February 22nd. He arrived as the Ostrogoths were making their move, and the two armies clashed. Belisarius himself was forced to fight at the front. He was quickly identified by the 22 turncoats and became the primary target of an intense battle. Belisarius fought off attacker after attacker while his guards did their best to protect him. The two sides fought all day while the Romans took heavy casualties but still managed to kill around 1,000 Ostrogoths. Though, again, that number comes from Procopius and is probably exaggerated. Around sunset, there was enough of a lull in the Ostrogothic attack for the Romans to make a run for the city walls. But when they reached the gates, the guards refused to let them in. With daylight fading, they could not recognize Belisarius, who was covered in dirt and blood after the battle. The Ostrogoths were also advancing, and the guards feared that they would rush in before the gates could be closed. Stuck outside, the men panicked. But Belisarius kept his cool. He gathered his weary men into formation and charged the enemy. The Ostrogoths believed that these were fresh soldiers flooding out of Rome and fell back to regroup with the rest of their army. Belisarius then brought his men back to the gates, which were now opened with the Ostrogoths now fleeing. As soon as he entered the city, Belisarius went to work coordinating the defenses. While he was doing this, a messenger from Bessus raced to him with shocking news. The Ostrogoths had breached a section of the walls. Once again, the men around Belisarius panicked, and once again, Belisarius kept his cool. He was pretty sure that this information was incorrect, and immediately sent scouts on horseback to check it out. The scouts quickly confirmed that Belisarius' instincts were correct, and that the Ostrogoths were not in the city. This alleviated the panic. It was now evening on February 22nd. Belisarius had been awake since dawn. He had not eaten since he had set out that morning and he had fought a vicious battle at the Salarian Bridge. And only now, after an extremely long and exhausting day, was the general finally convinced to grab some food and get some rest. The next morning, the Siege of Rome would begin. 
The Ostrogoths constructed seven camps outside of Rome's walls, covering about one half to two thirds of their length. They then cut the aqueducts to the city. Belisarius' men quickly blocked up the channels inside the broken aqueducts to prevent the Ostrogoths from entering the city in the same way that Belisarius' men had entered Naples. The river Tiber was Rome's main water supply, but the aqueducts did serve other purposes. One was to supply the city's public baths. Without the aqueducts, they were forced to close down. This further angered an already agitated Roman citizenry. The other purpose of the aqueducts was to power the city's water mills, which ground wheat into flour to feed the populace. Whereas the baths were a luxury, food was a necessity, so Belisarius had to take action here. He anchored boats in the Tiber and tied the wheels of the mill to the boats. The water running through the river was enough to spin the wheels and keep the mills functioning. Vitiges countered this by ordering logs, branches, and the bodies of dead Roman soldiers thrown into the Tiber. The debris would flow to the mill wheels and jam them up. Belisarius, though, countered this by having a large iron chain placed across the Tiber. Water easily flowed past the chain, but larger objects were caught up and removed from the river before they could do any damage. As the siege progressed, though, the Roman citizens grew more and more angry at the limited rations, the closed baths, and the overall unpleasantness of the siege. Vitiges hoped to capitalize on their discomfort. He sent an envoy named Albus into the city, who addressed Belisarius, his officers, and the Roman Senate, imploring them to surrender. But Belisarius was unwavering. Quote, Whoever of you hopes of setting foot in Rome without a fight is mistaken in his judgment. For as long as Belisarius lives, it is impossible for him to relinquish this city. With Belisarius clearly not willing to leave quietly, Vitiges began planning for a massive assault on the city's walls. He ordered giant wooden towers constructed with large wheels at the base. Oxen would pull these towers towards the walls, allowing his men to attack from the top. The Eastern Romans could hear the construction in the Ostrogothic camp, but did not know what to expect. I'm sure whatever they pictured was terrifying. When the equipment was finished, the Ostrogoths approached the walls with their mobile towers, rams, ladders, and thousands upon thousands of men. The Eastern Romans were apprehensive, but Belisarius actually laughed when he saw the would-be attack. When the moment was right, he instructed his men to aim for the oxen. A barrage of arrows stopped the animals in their tracks. This served two purposes. Firstly, it immobilized the siege equipment, but secondly, it created large, unmovable obstacles that blocked the paths of the rest of the Ostrogothic army. Not only were the towers worthless, they were actually a hindrance. The Ostrogoths were now easy targets for Roman arrows. At the same time, though, the Ostrogoths were also attacking the Cornelian Gate, where Constantinus commanded the defenses. Here, the Romans had a far more difficult time, and the defenders atop the tomb of Hadrian resorted to breaking statues and launching the pieces at the attackers. The attack here was also repulsed by the Romans. At the Vivarium, though, things were a little different. Here, the walls were very weak, and the Roman citizens had built a small enclosure around the area to use it as a holding pen of sorts for wild animals that were used in shows. The Ostrogoths started to break through the outer wall, and Bessus, who commanded the defenses, called for help from Belisarius. When Belisarius arrived, he ordered his men to fall back behind the smaller wall. As the Ostrogoths began to break through the outer wall, Belisarius ordered his men to attack, trapping the attackers in the confined area. They tried to escape back through the break in the outer wall, but ran into their countrymen trying to storm in. The Ostrogoths took heavy losses in the confusion, and the attack was repelled. Procopius says that the Ostrogoths lost a total of 30,000 men in this failed assault. That number 
again, is probably exaggerated, but the losses were certainly significant. And after this failed attempt, the Ostrogoths dug in for what was now going to be a protracted siege. Belisarius still had not received his requested reinforcements from Justinian, so he sent word back to Constantinople that he urgently needed more men. Justinian had already sent about 1,600 men to Belisarius, but they had been held up due to poor weather. Belisarius did not know that they were already en route. In order to counter a prolonged siege, Belisarius made the decision to evacuate women and children from Rome and move them south to Naples. Belisarius knew that food would soon be in short supply, and he didn't want to waste anything on people that were not fighting for his cause. He kept Roman men of military age in the city, armed them, and had them stand guard on the walls. He promised to pay them a wage for their efforts. Vitiges did not stop the refugees from heading south, but he did capture Portus, a village outside of Rome on the Mediterranean coast at the mouth of the Tiber. Controlling Portus meant that he would be able to block some supplies from getting to Rome through the river. Belisarius probably could have secured the town with a small force, but he didn't think that he could spare any men from his defense of the city. He was extremely concerned about possible turncoats within the city's walls, and his fears are perhaps best seen in his treatment of Pope Silvarius. Towards the end of March, Silvarius was accused of secretly plotting to open the gates of the city to the Ostrogothic army. These charges were completely false, but they resulted in Belisarius deposing Silvarius and making Vigilius a papal ambassador to Constantinople, the new pontiff. Vigilius is the first pope of what is often referred to as the Byzantine papacy, a period of Constantinople's political domination over the Roman pontiff that lasted over 200 years. Around mid-April, the 1600 men under the command of Martinus and Valerianus finally arrived in Italy. Belisarius now tried to take the war to the Ostrogoths by launching a series of raids. The Romans had archers in their cavalry, whereas the Ostrogothic cavalry consisted largely of spearmen and swordsmen. The Romans were able to charge out of the gates, attack the Ostrogoths from a distance, and hurry back to safety before the enemy could get close enough to inflict damage of their own. The effectiveness of these raids gave Belisarius the confidence to launch a larger attack. He attempted a major cavalry assault on the Ostrogothic camp, but he did not have enough men to force the enemy into retreat. The two sides were now at an impasse. Vindiges was not strong enough to break through the walls, and Belisarius was not strong enough to break the siege. Everyone knew that this would be a long, hot, terrible summer. During the months-long stalemate, the city's food supply was depleted. Citizens resorted to eating sausages made from the mules that died within the city. It was a pretty dismal time to be in Rome. By autumn, things were looking grim. Belisarius sent his wife, Antonina, and Procopius southwards towards Campania to find whatever food was available and find any available men to help continue the defense. When they got to Naples, they were able to get 500 men and enough food to keep the city fed for a little longer. But that wasn't all. While they were in Naples, more reinforcements from Justinian were finally arriving across Italy. 300 cavalry under Zeno arrived in Samnium. A fleet of 3,000 Assyrians landed in Naples. 800 Thracians and 1,000 cavalry landed in Dryas. All in all, over 5,000 men had now arrived on the peninsula, which more than doubled the total number of men that Belisarius had used to defend Rome. As these reinforcements moved north, Belisarius launched an attack on the north side of the city to draw the attention of the Ostrogoths away from the fresh troops. The men were able to safely enter the city, and the scales now tipped in Belisarius' favor. 
the Ostrogoths, who themselves were running out of supplies and had taken heavy losses over the course of the siege, were demoralized at the arrival of Belisarius' reinforcements. In December, Vitiges decided that it was time to ask Belisarius for peace. Vitiges offered to give up claims on Sicily and southern Italy, but Belisarius told the Ostrogothic envoys that he was not able to negotiate on behalf of Justinian. The two sides were able to agree on an armistice, while Vitiges could send representatives to Constantinople. The two sides were basically at a standstill while the diplomats tried to work things out. Belisarius took the opportunity to resupply Rome without fear of attack. The Ostrogoths withdrew from Portus, and the Eastern Romans reoccupied the port town. The Ostrogoths insisted that this violated the terms of the temporary peace, but Belisarius scoffed at them. As winter waned and spring approached, Vitiges decided that he too could push the envelope and began exploring possible ways to force Belisarius to surrender, but concluded that he only had one real option, a surprise assault on the city's walls. He gathered his men and moved towards the Pincian Gate, but Roman guards saw the Ostrogoths advancing and launched an attack of their own. The Ostrogoths were quickly repelled. Vitiges had one last trick up his sleeve, though. He bribed two Eastern Roman guards to drug wine and distribute it to their compatriots. One of the men went straight to Belisarius with the plot, and the whole thing was foiled before it could get going. Belisarius decided that if the Ostrogoths were going to take these actions, the armistice was null and void. He ordered cavalry units under John to move into towns in the north. John occupied Ariminum, only around 30 miles from Ravenna. When Vitiges heard how close the enemy was to his capital, he had no choice but to withdraw from Rome. As he picked up his camps and moved them north, Belisarius launched an attack at their rear, sending many more Ostrogoths to their death as they tried to retreat. The Siege of Rome had lasted a total of 374 days. Belisarius' army had been pushed to the breaking point, but in the end, they still held the Eternal City.